Right. As you have seen already, we are into a series studying the Old Testament prophetic book of Hosea. If you have never heard of the Old Testament book of Hosea before, that is okay. We will walk into it together. For those of you who have been with us, we are looking at a story of viewing our human relationship with God as a marriage, a covenant commitment together that is both experiential, knowing one another, and is a covenant, a commitment to one another. Last week, uh, my good friend Shana was able to be here and preach while I was spending some time with my family up in New England and helping out with them. And I will say it was one of my first times in a long time experiencing our service through the live stream. So live stream, people, I feel your pain as you're watching this. It is nice to be able to do. It's just not as good. It's not as good as being here and singing it together. The worship portion of live streaming, I think, is the hardest possible part as I am singing in a living room disconnected from everybody else here, but so grateful that technology allows us to still bridge that gap between and kind of watch and still be a part of what God is doing here at Pennington AG Church. Shana walked us through a love that never fails, that God's love continues and never fails, and even looking at 1 Corinthians 13 as an example. In the series of Hosea, we are talking a lot about God's love and his abundant care for us, But this morning, we are in the very middle of this study, going to touch base on something that may not feel like God's love, but we will talk about the fact that our actions have consequences and that sin is brought by our decisions into the world. But as we look at Hosea, I want to give you a brief overview for those you have just one minute. Let's walk through. Hosea is a story about God's people that have rebelled and God will bring severe consequences, but... God's love and mercy are more powerful than humanity's sin. Our world suffers when we ask the question of suffering and pain because of what we make this world to be as human beings. Our greed, our lust, our chaos, abuse, injustice, and selfishness have consequences. And God brings judgment for our abuses. And we want God to bring judgment for abuses when they're done to us and when we see them in others. And as the book of Hosea tells us, God's love for humanity will always be stronger than the consequences of our sin, than the destruction we bring. And God's purpose in correcting us is never to destroy, but to heal. As a doctor who digs in to pull the bullet out of our body, as the doctor who recorrects the broken bone, sometimes that there is pain involved in healing. And as God reaches into humanity and into creation, there is pain as he heals and corrects us. He is not there to punish us into oblivion, but he is the good doctor who reaches in to heal our destruction and brokenness. This is difficult for us to understand. So famously, the book of Hosea, God has this prophet marry an unfaithful woman, live out that experience that he could speak with authority on God's relationship to humanity. If you are reading along with us and you've never read Hosea before, then one of my encouragements is read these books. If you're walking along in this sermon, you're like, there's a story in there where God has a prophet marry a prostitute who's then unfaithful and he has to buy her back in that. That's crazy. I didn't know that was in the Bible. Then begin in your own time, in your own study, It is important that we read the entirety of God's Word. From Genesis to Revelation is the story of God's good news in Christ Jesus, not just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the whole Bible tells us. It is in the Old Testament prophets that we see how dark and painful being a human being can be. The depth of brokenness and pain we bring on each other, we only know when we read the Old Testament prophets of how bad things get causes us to yearn for God's goodness and mercy. And it's in the prophetic works that we see human beings cry out for salvation, that we need a savior, we need a rescuer, that when we get to Jesus in the New Testament, we breathe a huge sigh of relief. It is in reading the entirety of the Bible that Jesus becomes so much richer and beautiful to us. The minor prophets themselves, as we study them, elevate Jesus. The world is broken. We need a Savior. 
Let's dive in this morning into our text. We'll be reading from Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. You have Bibles underneath some of your chairs. It's a little surprise for you if you do or if you don't. And you can also follow along on whatever app you have. It'll be on the screen behind me in NLT translation. Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel. The Lord has brought charges against you, saying, There is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in your land. You make vows and you break them. You kill and you steal and you commit adultery. There is violence everywhere, one murder after another. This is why your land is in mourning and everyone is wasting away. Even the wild animals, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea are disappearing. Don't point your finger at someone else and try to pass the blame. My complaint, you priests, is with you. So you will stumble in broad daylight and your false prophets will fall with you in the night. And I will destroy Israel, your mother. My people are being destroyed because they don't know me. Since you priests refuse to know me, I refuse to recognize you as my priests. Since you have forgotten the laws of your God, I will forget to bless your children. I'm going to begin this morning in a dangerous area for me by talking a little bit about science. I was a liberal arts major. I was a religion and sociology major. I am not a science guy. In fact, in college, I had to take two science courses as a requirement. One of them I took accidentally was physics because in high school I did pretty good in physics. So I was like at college, I was like, I'll take physics. And my friends in my religion department said, no, you're supposed to take science for liberal arts majors, not physics. And every time I would tell in the class, they'd be like, oh yeah, you're a physics major? And I was like, nope. And they'd be like, then why are you taking this class? And I was like, I have no idea. It was incredibly hard and I struggled really bad. One thing I did learn is that Isaac Newton created in us laws of how nature works. In the 17th century, mythologically or famously, an apple falls from a tree and hits Sir Isaac Newton in the head. He is an English scientist. By this, he discovers that there is gravity. Things fall towards the earth. He also established three general rules of thermodynamics, of physics, of how the world works. His third law is that every reaction has an equal and opposite Reaction, right? We take an action, it has a reaction, has a proportionate reaction, not disproportionate. It doesn't react more, doesn't react less. Forces, when they happen, other things occur as well. If Isaac Newton is discovering natural laws, he's discovering how creation works. If he's understanding how creation works, then we can understand a little bit about God's plan and work in this world. It is not incorrect to say that the Bible argues the same thing, that the actions we take have natural reactions to them. Whether God is showing us grace and mercy and forgiveness, our choices, our behaviors, and our actions have consequences. When you read the minor prophets, they articulate this wonderfully and often very painfully. The decisions you have made as a people the actions you have taken towards the vulnerable people or the actions you have taken with the body God gave to you, the actions and the allegiances you have taken with foreign nations will have consequences. And it is not just me, God the Creator, punishing you. It is often me taking my hand of grace off of you and allowing your destructive choices to move to their natural ends. Our decisions have consequences and reactions to them. Hosea chapter 4, verse 1. Hosea writes, There is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in your land. The Christopher Nolan Batman movies and the very first one, The Dark Knight, uh, he, or Batman Begins, he makes an argument we are known by our decisions. Batman tries to explain to a woman who does not know yet that he is Batman, says to her, underneath all of these actions, there is more to me. I'm not what you see. I'm not these decisions you see in my life. And she says to him, 
It's not what you are underneath or who you think you are. It is what we do that defines us. Your actions are who you are. The decisions you make, the words you say. We only know each other by the decisions we make. And oftentimes we try to articulate something along the lines of, well, that's not really who I am. When we get in trouble, that's the argument we make, right? That's not really me. That thing I said when I was most angry or that action I took when I had too much to drink, that's not really me. The truth of the matter is, that's more me than perhaps any other time in my life. You're seeing me, my actions, my decisions, how I feel in life. Our faith, Hosea says, is known by our actions. He says, you are not faithful and you are not kind. Thus, you don't know God. I'm making a judgment on you. I'm saying you don't know who he is. And I'm saying that because you're not a faithful person and you're not a kind person. If you were faithful and kind, you would know who you're made to be. You would know your creator. No faithfulness, Hosea says. A lack of faithfulness or what faithfulness is, people do what they say. He says, you don't do that. You do what's easy. You do what's easiest for you. You do what you want to. You are not loyal and you practice no self-discipline. Faithfulness, what we do with who we are, who I am my sexuality, my thoughts, my feelings, the disciplines of my body, my mind, my heart, my emotions, my faithfulness is in who I am and what I do with me. He says, you're not faithful. You are not disciplining yourself. He says, you're not kind. You don't value human life. People are no longer treated as individuals with thoughts and feelings. You are devaluing people around you. You're devaluing humanity itself. Kindness is simply viewing other people as valuable. It says, you're not kind. You're not disciplining yourself, and you're not treating others with kindness and respect. He says, if you knew God, you would. Because to know God is to know ourselves. To know God is to know who we are made to be because we are made in his image. To know God for faithfulness is to know that my life is on purpose and has a purpose. My life is valuable. This body is valuable. My mind and my heart are valuable. And so I treat them with discipline and respect. To know God is to know kindness, which is to say that other people are made on purpose and are valuable. And I treat them with loving kindness and respect. From this awareness, the laws of physics or the law of God is meant to be a tool not to oppress or repress, but as a guidance of our Creator moving us to our best lives, of our Creator moving this world towards order and love, to honor and discipline my body, to use and challenge my mind, to engage my heart and my emotions, and to love and care for others. As theologian and author Carmen Imes says in her book, Made in the Image of God, she says the knowledge of God envisions a different kind of life, characterized by self-discipline and self-giving love. Imagine a community where every member actively worked to love and protect their neighbor. This is the community that the collection of Scripture argues for, a community of kindness and love. And what Hosea says is, I do not see these in your community. Thus, my conclusion is, you don't know the God you claim to know. You may know about him, but you don't truly know what he cares about. Hosea is a book about God's unfailing love and kindness that is more powerful than our sin and selfishness, but that love and kindness is empty if we do not understand, own, and repent of our culpability of sin and brokenness that we bring into this world? How do we own it and be transformed by God's mercy? I would argue it's simply this, accepting the responsibility for our sin, accepting our responsibility, owning it. We are a part of this. The world is broken because each of us contributes to that brokenness. 
There is pain in this world because we create a cycle of action and reaction, of hurt and pain, or as Gandhi says it, an eye for an eye, the whole world is blind. We keep reacting and reacting out of pain and suffering. Hosea chapter 4, verse 4, the prophet says it like this. Don't point your finger at someone else and try to pass the blame. Or the old adage, when you point your finger, there are three fingers pointing back at you. I heard this in fourth grade, and my friends and I started always pointing like this. You, it is him over there. I don't want to point back at myself. Hosea writes that, and we respond maybe to Hosea. Who, me? Surely not me. There are worse people in this world than I. There is a pattern in nearly every prophetic work that we read in the Old Testament where they begin with judgment towards all of humanity or to neighboring kingdoms around Israel. That's what Hosea is doing here. In the first verses, when he talks about the land and no kindness, he's talking about all all of humanity. He's like, everybody that lives here, not just Israel, all of the land. When he begins to use the word priest, he's talking about the Israelites because they're God's representative. So he's saying, this whole land is fallen. But then he says, but you, my people... I'm really upset at you because you are supposed to know. They don't really know, but you should. We love it when God or justice or comeuppance, however you want to say it, happens to others for their sin, right? Somebody cuts you off and is flying down the highway, and then a few minutes later you see them pulled over by the police, and what are we doing? Yes, good. And when I cut somebody off and I'm flying down the highway and the police pull me over, I begin to be like, oh, that's so unfair. I was just, it was just slightly over and all it's, the justice system is broken when it is me that is being punished, right? The Israelites are doing the same thing. Hosea is pointing out the sins of others like, yep, go get them. Sin points out the sin of ourselves. What? Me? No. We can see sin and punishment and brokenness on a wide scale. But the truth of Scripture is the wide scale of brokenness is dealt first in the individual. I have to conquer myself before I can try to be a part of healing this world, right? Human beings are sinful and cruel to each other. Yup, I've seen reality TV. I have social media. I agree with you. Humanity broken. We can all agree. But you are sinful in the way that you talk about your friends when they are not around. It's dehumanizing, it's hurtful, and it's breaking their trust. That's sin as well. That is what's contributing. And now we go, wait a minute, you don't really understand. You don't understand what Karen is really like. You don't get it. The powerful have a responsibility to the poor. And there is a problem when wealthy people are shooting themselves into space and poor people are born into a world without clean water. We all say, yes, I agree. Check that box. Agree with that. But when I have a smartphone in my pocket, a two-car household, and the fact that maybe I own property makes me one of the wealthiest people on earth, then God may ask, what am I doing with my blessings? Is it a sin to waste? Well, I say, well, now, my neighbor's car... (laughs) When we say one in three women throughout the globe will be victims of sexual assault at some point in their lifetime, when we know that 27 million people are currently being trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation, we all go, yes, that's a problem. That is wrong. But when someone says that pornography is one of the biggest demands for sex trafficking and that it psychologically turns our brains to change us to devalue human life, and to increase aggression towards women and vulnerable, 97% of us in the room may go, um, how do we view the brokenness of our world by owning our own individual part of it? It's big. It's unwieldy. feels like no one has a solution. What the prophets point us back to is to say, don't get caught up in the wide scope of it. Invite the Holy Spirit to speak to who you are and own your own part of it. And let's work one person at a time. 
The work of Scripture reveals to us a universal truth that humanity is in need of healing and salvation. We just look around at the news for two seconds and know that. It also reveals that the pathway is most often each of us taking ownership of our sin and in confession and repentance turning to a God that can heal us. Now, full confession, I struggle with the book of Hosea. I struggle with it in prepping the series even because we read a story of a woman named Gomer that the prophet marries. And for the first three chapters, it really demonizes Gomer. And depicts her as this woman with like deep sexual desires and she's a predator and she's pulling Hosea down and she wants the sexual sin so badly. But I also am an American man in 2023 with a semi-enlightened perspective that understands most people involved in the sex industry are not predators, they're victims. They're victims of economics or they're victims of other abuse in their life or they're victims of pressure put on them. And so I read a story like Gomer and I go, well, is she really that uh, should be owning this sin? Like maybe there are products that put her there. How do we get there? We live in a culture where we see causation on wide scales. And we know that a bully in fifth grade bullies mostly because there's probably brokenness in their home and they're acting out of that brokenness. And their home may be broken because the parents of the generation before them were abusive alcoholics and passed that on from one generation to the other. And at some point, we have compassion on each other to where we go, is anybody really culpable for the sin of their lives? Aren't we all just swirling and reacting? And what Scripture tells us is you may not be the cause of the brokenness in your life, but you are responsible to put an end to it now. To say no more. It it goes no further than my life now. I end the cycle of brokenness and pain by my decisions and by owning my life now and here in this moment. You may not have caused it. Maybe your parents put that into your life, and for that I am so sorry. Maybe it is the group in the community you grew up in as a child and how they treated you that has formed your brain into different ways. And for that, I, again, am so sorry. But we take on a collective challenge by our creator to invite him into us to do what we cannot and to overcome this pattern of sin and brokenness in our lives, individually, each of us, one at a time. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 5, gives us kind of a framework of how to do this. Speaks into Hosea. This is a psalm of David. If you even read the caption of it, you would know this is a psalm of David after he has done some terrible things we'll talk about in a moment. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. Psalm 51, we see King David, uh, Old Testament ruler and king, owning his sin, and his sin is a doozy in this passage. He has raped another man's wife when she became pregnant. He then manipulates a situation to have her husband murdered in order to hide his sin. And he does not come to a realization of his sin himself. It is a loving friend who speaks David's language in order to call him out and make him realize the depth of his own brokenness and sin. He is confessing for life in prison sort of sins kind of crime here. And he is owning it. One thing we can take from that is, I don't know where your life has been or the depth of guilt and shame that weigh on your shoulder, but there is no depth of sin, no depth of guilt and pain that we can walk into that God cannot forgive and heal and move into restoration for us. Having said that, there are also consequences for David's sin. The child born from his sin dies. His family, decades later, falls apart 
directly as a result of David's actions here in this moment. His sons commit heinous crimes, take the kingdom from him. It's painful. Tim Keller, in his last published book before his death in 2022, wrote a book simply called Forgiveness. And in it, we're going to look at what he talks about as repentance and false repentance of how we own our sin. He calls them counterfeits of repentance. What does it do when it looks like we are owning our sin, but we're not really? There are three, he says, blame shifting, self-pity, and emotional performance. First is blame shifting. What does blame shifting look like? It's justification of our sin. Well, I'm not greedy. I'm ambitious. And I'm thrifty. I don't have a problem with alcohol. I'm the life of the party. I'm a fun guy. Just chill out. I'm not mean. I just tell it like it is. We blame shift. It's not really that I'm a problem. It's just you're perceiving my problem incorrectly. You don't understand my heart behind it. We shift responsibility. Well, I may have said hurtful things, but only because you pushed me there. I've suffered a lot, and I think I'm entitled to some indulgence and anger. I think I'm entitled to that based on how my life has been, and you need to understand that. Or we simply say that you accusing me of sin are just exaggerating. Yeah, sure, I raised my voice, but the the story you're telling is not how that went down. That's not really what I said, and you're just remembering it through the lens of emotion. I should not have done that, but people do a lot worse than that in similar circumstances. I don't think I'm really all that bad. We shift the blame away from ourselves. David says in verse 5 of Psalm 51, I was born guilty. And he's not blame shifting of saying, hey, it's not my fault. I was born this way. What he's saying is, I understand how hard it is to be human because I take an honest look at the depravity in my own heart. And then I look around at the world and I say, hey, I'm a part of this. I'm a part of this too. I'm human and I'm broken and I'm causing pain. I am owning my sin, not blaming it or shifting it away. I see how dark my heart is and I know that that is what we struggle with as people. The second is self-pity. Self-pity says, I've really made a mess of my life. It is so bad. I have messed this up. I have done terrible things. And it sounds kind of like repentance, but it's not. What we are upset about are the consequences of our decisions and sin, not the sin itself. I'm upset because I got caught. I am upset because you see what I've done and who I am. Self-pity says, look at how I'm suffering because of what I've done. I'm suffering so bad. Yes, I know I did bad, but I'm suffering so much that you should feel bad for me now because I am suffering. Self-pity takes our sin and it makes it about ourselves again. It's not about what I've done wrong, but it's you're now starting to feel bad for me because of how bad I feel about what I've done. David pointedly says, against you, God, and you alone have I sinned. He's not minimizing the sin and pain that he's done to Bathsheba and her husband Uriah and their family. But what he is saying is, it's not the product and the fact that I got caught and called out by my prophet. It is about the fact that there is a God who made right and wrong, and I have chosen wrong, and I have sinned against the order of the world God has made. I have broken his plan in my life. Not the consequences, but the actions themselves I must own. Self-pity often goes away when the consequences go away. And that's what self-pity is waiting for. It is waiting for us to forget about the consequences and then we move on. I'll give you an example that'll give you an emotional response. It's that moment we've done something wrong and we know that it's going to have fallout to it, but nobody yet knows that we've done it wrong yet and you have that pit in your stomach and the butterflies are swirling. And in this moment, graciously, beyond all of our thoughts, we didn't get found out. And then what happens? The pain ebbs away. I didn't get caught. I move on. And maybe I'll do it worse the next time. 
because I didn't get caught this time. Self-pity doesn't deal with the actual sin. It tries to minimize the consequences. Third and final is the one we do in church most often, emotional performance. If I am loud enough and emotional enough, that will fix the problem. That is what God requires of me, right? Tears. Emotional performance is where we make a big show of how bad we feel about our actions. If I beat myself up, if I show that I feel a lot of things about what I've done, of course I'm not a bad person. Look at how bad I feel. I am not a sinful person. A sinful person wouldn't be crying this much. A sinful person wouldn't have wrote a seven-paragraph essay on my Instagram account about what I've done. That's because I'm a good person that I am showing you all of my emotions. It's wailing at the altar. It's long apologies. It's walking around with the weight of the world on our shoulders so everybody knows how bad we feel, how guilty we are, how gross I think I am. In those moments, it's still about you. It's still about you and how you feel about how others feel about what you've done. We do this in hopes that somebody will come alongside of us and say, ah, you feel so bad. You know, it's not that bad. I I know this guy. He's way worse than you. Like, just go into this version of it, right? Proverbs 28, 13 gives us a pathway. People who conceal their sins, and all of these are modes of concealment, will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. Simple as that. If we confess and own our sin, our culpability in it, I broke this. I lied. I stole. I didn't honor my body. I didn't honor the people around me. If we confess that, and then what is important in Proverbs, we repent or we turn from it. I make restitution. I make new decisions. I change my lifestyle. If we hide our sin under layers of blame-shifting, self-pity, and emotional performance, we will not heal. And our lives will shrivel under the weight of our sin. If we as a community routinely hide our sin under layers of justification, we will crumble as ancient Israel crumbled under the weight of their own sin during the time of Hosea. We serve a merciful God but we do not worship or recognize his mercy and grace if we are not honest about our sin and our brokenness. Or as Tim Keller finally says it, to forsake is to make full renunciation of the sinful behavior, both in our heart attitude and in practical action. When John the Baptist led people to the brink of repentance, they asked, what should we do? He answered, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And by that, he meant practical action that reversed their wrong behavior. What do we do? We bear fruit in keeping with repentance. We change our actions. We turn from our sin and act anew. Hosea describes it like this, by receiving God's mercy. To know God is to know his mercy. To be intimately connected with God is to receive God's mercy. As he says in verse 6 of Hosea 4, my people are being destroyed because they don't know me. One of the most powerful and terrifying verses in all of Hosea is the revelation that Israel, God's people, his chosen people with a collection of writings about God and a story about God setting them free and laws to guide them, didn't know him. They had all these pieces and yet were unaware. How? Because to know God, Hosea is arguing, is to examine our lives And ask, is my life faithful and kind? Am I faithful to what he has given me as a steward in my life? Do I discipline my body, my mind, my resources in honor of him? Am I kind in how I live, loving and generous and merciful and hospitable to the people he has given around me? And do I invite God to produce more of this faithfulness and kindness? It is just that simple, Hosea says. 
Or as Paul writes it to the Roman church in Romans chapter 3, for everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Everyone has sinned. Just take that off the table. We all have sinned and fall short. We all in this room, you may have walked in and you feel particularly down and everybody else is dressed really nice or you're new and they all knew when to stand up, sit down and what songs to sing. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm worse than these people. You aren't. Or come in and be like, I don't know how to perform the way the rest of these people perform. They seem to be much better people than I. They're not. We are all sinners. We are all human beings made in the image of God, but fallen and broken from that calling and that glory. Justice is important. Yes, evil needs to be taken care of and rid from this world. It does. That is part of kindness. But often, we need to begin at a place where we stop looking around at each other's sin and stop correcting the communal sins outside of us and take a moment and begin in our own hearts and our own lives. Before I can fix the world, I need the transforming work of the God who made me to heal my own heart and mind. We have a ton of justice warriors out there who are deeply broken and flawed, just perpetuating and continuing it forward. Maybe our intentions are in the right place, but our execution is terrible. And the Holy Spirit points us back to our own healing. The people of Hosea didn't know God. We have the privilege of knowing God because he's been revealed in his son, Christ Jesus. We know what God is like. And we see in the story of Jesus a faithful, kind person who disciplined himself and loved others and did it so far that he disciplined himself for our own sins onto a cross and died in place of our sin and judgment and was kind and that he conquered it and left it in the grave that we may live free and forgiven. The grace of Jesus is free for us, but it is not free. The law of thermodynamics says every action has an equal and opposite reaction. The action of our sins had the reaction of God himself dying in our place. Our sins didn't go nowhere. They went on to the loving kindness of the one who made us. And he took our place. And as the gospels tell us, our actions when we repent, still have reactions. And we'll finish with this story. In Luke chapter 3, Jesus is teaching and he says, even corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized and asked, teacher, what should we do? This is John speaking. He replied, collect no more taxes than the government requires. Don't exploit people. They said, well, what should we do? John said, don't extort money or mace false accusations and be content with your pay. What does that mean? Why is that important? He says, if you are repentant of your sin, go and live differently. Change your behavior. Not because you need to to earn God's love, but because God's love has changed the paradigm and now out of his grace and mercy, we want to change this world. And if there are reactions to the actions of our sin, we can collectively end it by the power of the Spirit as we react to sin done to us by forgiving and being gracious and merciful. We react back out of mercy and love. But it begins in me. I want to give you a challenge this morning. Just simply invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you where you are. Ask the Holy Spirit, what patterns of brokenness am I still living in myself? 
Don't worry about the person to your right or your left. They have a lot of crazy sins, but don't worry about theirs. Focus on yours this morning and say, God, pull out the parts of me that are still broken. Put your finger on it and help me to change. I confess it this morning that I am a sinner in need of grace still in this moment. Lord, will you give me the strength to change and to make restitution in this world by being an agent of faithfulness and kindness? If you bow your heads with me all over the room. If you're new this morning and you would say that you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want to give you a chance just to pray one simple prayer that can begin that journey of knowing him, that can begin that journey of healing into your brokenness. If you are a follower of Jesus, use this as a moment to re-invite the Holy Spirit to examine you and what Jesus has saved you from. If you pray with me. Jesus, in this moment, I confess my need for a Savior. I am broken and not living as you made me to live. I am not faithful. I am not kind. I need you to transform me and to forgive me. Jesus, I believe that you came to this earth fully God, fully man, and you lived a perfect, righteous, kind, faithful life. And that you went to the cross as the reaction to our sin and you died in our place, conquering sin and death. You were buried in the ground and on the third day, you rose from the grave, conquering sin and death itself, living eternally, resurrected, so that the promise for each of us is that we would live resurrected lives now and one day in the future for eternity. Jesus, you gave your life for me. Today, I commit my life to follow you. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I'll invite up our prayer team to my right and to my left. And as the worship team leads us in one final song this morning, I will just give you a challenge. Wherever you are in the room, just take these next few minutes and make them a personal wrestling time with Jesus. Say, Jesus, point out my sin this morning. I'm going to give it over to you. And may I leave this morning just one step further on my path of repentance. Give me a way that you want me to change. If you have your prayer card, I mean, your note cards, you can write it down on there. This is one area that God has pointed out to me this morning. This is how I am going to change this morning. And if you want prayer, we would love to pray with you up here at the altar. We'll pray that journey together. And for me, sometimes I need to come to the altar as a physical demonstration of, God, I'm stepping out. Will you meet me and transform me? And so I invite you, if you can, all over the room to stand with me as we close out this morning. And as I pray this final prayer, when I say amen, that's your cue to react. You can begin to join in worship. You can come forward to the altar space or come forward to receive prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, for our reaction to it. Lord, that it would drive us to you would drive us to healing and to response. Lord, draw out of me all that is not of you. May I be more kind and faithful today. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.